It's uh, June 19th here in Seoul and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour. Starting with Russian leader Vladimir Putin's North Korea visit. Putin arrived in Pyongyang early Wednesday where he was greeted by the regime's leader Kim Jong-un. The two were set to hold a series of talks both open and in private during Putin's one-day stay there. And on the same day, foreign and defense officials of South Korea and China held talks for the first time in nearly a decade. Seoul voiced concerns over Putin's North Korea trip, whereas China remained rather neutral about it. The S&P 500 hit yet another new all-time high for the second day in a row on Tuesday, driven by AI momentum. NVIDIA beat Microsoft to become the most valuable company in the world. Russian leader Vladimir Putin touched down in Pyongyang early this morning, ahead of his third-ever summit with Kim Jong-un. Now, Putin is expected to spend this one-day trip exploring ways to deepen Moscow's ties with Pyongyang. Our North Korean Affairs correspondent Kim jong sil starts us off. According to the Kremlin, Russian President Vladimir Putin landed at Pyongyang International Airport after 2 a.m. on Wednesday morning, where he was met by North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The two leaders are expected to take part in an official welcome ceremony, followed by a summit. Just before arrival in Pyongyang, Putin accepted a proposal from Russia's foreign ministry for a bilateral comprehensive strategic partnership agreement with North Korea. Both sides are expected to sign the agreement on Wednesday before Putin leaves for Vietnam later in the day. How do you think this uh, signing of the uh, comprehensive strategic partnership agreement will change the relationship dynamics of Pyongyang and Moscow? The Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Agreement is at a much higher level than current treaties between Russia and North Korea on friendly cooperation. It can go as close as a military alliance, so we are keeping a close eye on whether it might include an automatic military intervention or something similar. Putin's visit is also being closely monitored by Washington. With regard to um, Mr. Putin and his travels uh, to North Korea, look, we've seen as you've said, Russia try uh, in desperation to develop uh, and to strengthen relations with countries that can provide it with what it needs to continue the war of aggression that it started against Ukraine. He added that North Korea is providing munitions and other weapons to Moscow for use in Ukraine. Russia and North Korea may not publicize sensitive topics such as military and security cooperation. Just like the arms transfers between them, that's not publicized. In that sense, it's important for the South Korean government to try to monitor all discussions taking place between Russia and North Korea and let the international community know. Putin's visit to North Korea is his first in 24 years. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. And South Korea has expressed concerns over Putin's visit to North Korea during rare high-level talks with China. And high-level talks with China continue this week as Seoul aims to boost cooperation with Beijing. Our foreign affairs correspondent Pei Eunji reports. Foreign and defense officials from South Korea and China met in Seoul for high-level talks on Tuesday, the same day that Russian President Vladimir Putin headed to North Korea. During the meeting, South Korea expressed concerns over Putin's visit to Pyongyang, highlighting that this should not lead to stronger military cooperation between Russia and North Korea. It once again asked China to play a constructive role in order to achieve denuclearization. In response, China said its policy towards the Korean Peninsula has not changed and said it will play a constructive role in resolving issues in the region. Tuesday's 2 plus 2 meeting was led by Vice Foreign Minister Kim hong gyun and his Chinese counterpart Sun Weidong. The two countries agreed to hold such talks last month when President Yoon Song yeol sat down for a separate bilateral meeting with Chinese Premier Li Chang on the sidelines of the trilateral summit with Japan. The dialogue was first established in June 2013 and was held that year and in 2015 between director general level officials. The meeting has not taken place since then amid strained bilateral relations after South Korea agreed to deploy a U.S. missile defense shield called the Thought System. 
Meanwhile, another high-level Chinese official is set to visit South Korea. The foreign ministry announced that Shin Changxing, the chief of China's Changsu province, will visit South Korea for two days, starting Wednesday. It's a visit by a top Chinese provincial government official amid recent high-level exchanges between South Korea and China. We expect this opportunity to boost practical cooperation between South Korea and China. Changsu province, located on the east coast of China, has the second largest economy among provincial governments in the country and has close trade and investment ties with South Korea. While in Seoul, Shin is set to meet with South Korea's trade minister, as well as business people in the country. Peunji, Arirang News. While both Seoul and Beijing felt the time was right for agreement on improving relations, that level of cooperation did not stretch as far as comments from China on the Kim Jong and Vladimir Putin summit. Let's turn to Professor Joel Atkinson for more. Welcome back, Professor. Yeah, good morning. It's nice so, to be here. Security talks between Seoul and Beijing took place for the first time in nine years here in Seoul. Now, can we see the revival of such dialogue as a good signal in Seoul-Beijing relations? Yes, the, the dialogue held in Seoul yesterday was a so-called two plus two involving vice minister level foreign affairs officials as well as high-ranked defense officials. As you mentioned, it was the first such dialogue in nine years. Seoul has always wanted as much dialogue as possible and is at a higher a level as possible. So the fact that Beijing is willing to start this again is a signal that it believes some useful cooperation may be possible, or at least that it wants to send a signal to that effect. Well, what's notable about the talks uh, from yesterday was that Beijing said it hopes Russia-North Korea relations will contribute to regional peace and stability. What's your take on what Beijing said? Well, the talks reportedly lasted about four hours, mm -hmm. and then Korea's MOFA didn't release its statement until after midnight. And, uh, you know, the South Korean side expressed its deep concern about Putin's visit to North Korea and tried to convince China that strengthened military cooperation between those two would be bad for China. It also expressed concern about North Korea's provocations, such as those waste field balloons as well as uh, China's forceful repatriation of North Koreans in China back to North Korea. So then China's response, basically stating that its policy remains unchanged and emphasizing that it plays a constructive role in resolving issues on the peninsula. Well, to me, that suggests uh, Beijing has no interest in strengthening cooperation with South Korea in a way that would hurt the interests of North Korea or Russia. But perhaps it is interested in strengthening cooperation in a way that would hurt the interests of the United States. So not much of a surprising comment from China there again. And Putin's North Korea visit is also in full swing, as we all know. And did the two events just happen to take place at the same time, the Sour Beijing, uh, Beijing talks and Putin's North Korea visit? Is it just pure coincidence? That's a good question. This dialogue was announced following the Korea-Japan-China trilateral meeting at the end of May, and then the Russian media reported that Putin would visit Pyongyang only a little over a week ago. So we can't rule out something going on behind the scenes, but I think it's almost certainly a coincidence. Putin, of course, is a very busy man. He also has a trip to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He's not going to arrange his schedule around a Korea-China vice ministerial meeting. And some are suggesting that China allowing the meeting to go ahead, despite the timing, despite that coincidence, suggests that it's prioritizing Seoul over Pyongyang. But I think that's really a stretch. Uh, and when the Chinese government says the timing is unrelated, then it's probably safe to believe that. Right, then will Seoul and Beijing security talks and Putin's North Korea visits, you know, complicate relations between North Korea, China and Russia? I mean, will China be put in an, you know, uncomfortable spot? Well, this really depends on your theory of China, Russia, North Korea relations, because no one really knows the true dynamics except those three. Uh, and there's so much disinformation and misdirection around the issue. It seems the UN administration hopes that this dialogue is going to increase pressure on North Korea. Seoul can say that Beijing stands together in insisting that 
you know, those provocations are unacceptable and that progress has to be made on the nukes and the missiles. Um, and so some South Korean analysts, they're focusing on little signs in the language that Beijing is using to suggest that might be the case. However, I very much doubt Beijing sees it that way. Its focus is on the Americans. Beijing can say, you know, see your ally South Korea wants a cooperative relationship with us and needs our help and North Korea and Russia are deepening their cooperation. If you want to change this, then start agreeing to some of the concessions we want you to make. And indeed, the Chinese state media outlet, The Global Times, is basically saying about this dialogue that President Yoon is in a weak position and ready to improve his attitude towards China, but it's going to be a long-term effort to get South Korea on the right track, which I think you know, basically means essentially decreasing its cooperation with Washington. Let's also talk about the relations between South Korea and Russia, which have not been the best recently. And Putin did say in an interview uh, early this month that Moscow is willing to soften ties with SAR. Now, what kind of strategic move do you think that the South Korean government needs to make to make things better with the Kremlin? Well, I think basically the price will be no more weapons transfers, such as artillery shells to Ukraine, even if they're via a third country like the U.S., and also taking a step back from Ukraine diplomatically. So would President Yoon be willing to do that? I think, you know, the Global Times is not wrong that President Yoon is seeming a little chastened after his party's poor showing in the legislative elections and, you know, the difficulties having controlling North Korea's behavior. So he may be willing to take a step back from his, you know, what he's calling the values-based diplomacy and his efforts to push Korea forward as a global pivotal state. So we'll have to wait and see on that. I think, however, it's not clear that Russia would be willing to give much in return if he did. North Korea is playing an important role in supplying armaments, but it also provides labor and so on. Therefore, I think Russia and North Korea relations are going to keep getting better, keep getting stronger, regardless of any concessions you makes. That is uh, uh, indeed a concern. All right, Professor Atkinson, thank you so much for your time this morning. You have a lovely day. Yeah, thank you. The S&P 500 continues to rise as it reached another record high for the second straight day. With the index rising on AI momentum, NVIDIA surpassed Microsoft as the most valuable stock. Lee seung has more. Both the S&P 500 and Nasdaq closed at record highs on Tuesday, with the S&P 500 hitting a new all-time high for the second day straight. The S&P 500 rose 13.80 points, or 0.25 percent, to close the trading session at 5,487.03, while the tech-heavy Nasdaq ending 5.21 points, or 0.03 percent higher, to reach an all-time high of 17,862.23 points. The Standard & Poor's 500 is an index that tracks the stock performance of 500 of the largest companies listed on stock exchanges in the United States. It's one of the most commonly followed equity indexes and includes approximately 80 percent of the total market capitalization of U.S. listed public companies. The index also reached an all-time high for the 31st time this year, driven by AI momentum. And much of that AI-driven push can be attributed to NVIDIA. Dubbed Wall Street's AI poster child, the tech firm is now the most valuable company in the world, surpassing Microsoft for the title. NVIDIA shares rose 3.5 percent higher on Tuesday, while Microsoft fell 0.5 percent. Its market cap now stands at roughly 3.34 trillion U.S. dollars. The U.S. chipmaker has enjoyed a massive surge for the past 18 months as its chips are unmatched in producing processors that power AI systems, including generative AI, the technology behind OpenAI's ChatGPT. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. No major disruptions to medical treatment have been reported on the first day of community doctors' nationwide walkout on Tuesday here in South Korea. But the government warns that those engaging in illegal acts will be held responsible. Moon Hedeon has the details. 
Nationwide strikes led by the Korean Medical Association has resulted in little disruption for patients so far, but stern responses from the government. The health ministry reported that just under 15 percent of medical institutions around the country staged walkouts on Tuesday. But so far there has been no major break in medical treatment at community hospitals. During a rally on the same day, the KMA announced that it will start an indefinite walkout next Thursday should the government not meet what it claims are justified demands from doctors. Doctors were immediately ordered to return to work, with the government stating that failure to comply could lead to medical license suspensions. The KMA was also reported to the Fair Trade Commission for encouraging the illegal practice of refusing to treat patients. During a cabinet meeting on Tuesday, President Yoon Sago stipulated that such illegal actions must be met with an appropriate punitive response. 정부는 국민의 생명과 건강을 지킬 책무가 있는 만큼 환자를 저버린 불법 행위에 대해서는 엄정 대처할 수밖에 없습니다. 국민이 동의하지 않고 실현도 불가능한 주장을 고집하면 모두가 피해자가 될 수밖에 없습니다. He further emphasized that doctors should communicate their opinions instead of resorting to drastic measures, calling on junior doctors and medical students to resume their studies, and promising to provide the necessary support for them to do so. Medical professors at Seoul National University hospitals began an indefinite walkout the previous day, leading to the number of outpatient treatments at the hospital dropping by 27 percent on the first day. The Education Ministry responded by informing each university that professors participating in collective leave of absence from university hospitals could be subject to disciplinary action. But with medical professors at other major university hospitals commonly dubbed the Big Five such as Yonta University also set to join the walkouts next week and others in discussion to do so too, concerns are growing over how this could develop. The Catholic University of Korea is due to gather its medical professors on Thursday to discuss this matter and professors at Songyungwan University are also to convene soon. In an effort to minimize severe medical disruptions, the government has implemented a rotational on-call system for emergency cases. Moon Haeryeon, Arirang News. The Israeli military said Tuesday that its plans for attack in southern Lebanon have been approved amid growing clashes with Iran-backed Hezbollah militants. The Israel Defense Forces said the steps have been taken to accelerate readiness in the field, with the Israeli foreign minister threatening to destroy Hezbollah in an all-out war. Tensions have been flaring along the Lebanese border with Israel, as Israeli forces have been exchanging cross-border attacks with the militant group. At this time of the year, South Korea's southernmost resort island of Jeju becomes a popular spot for vividly colored hydrangea flowers. Our Park Kwon went there. Jeju Island is widely known for its different kinds of flowers that bloom by season. In summer, hydrangeas blossom in several spots across the island, especially in the southern part. At this time of year, Jeju is one of the best places to visit and take nice pictures with hydrangeas. As you can see, there's a wide variety of pastel color hydrangeas in pink, purple, blue, and many more. With these flowers, many tourist attractions on the island, including natural parks and botanical gardens, hold hydrangea festivals. Kyueri Natural Park is known to have Jeju's longest hydrangea festival, running from March until August. Hydrangeas, especially the purple ones, are so beautiful. I think it was really worth it coming here. It's so peaceful listening to the birds singing and feeling the fresh air in nature. It feels great to be here with my high school classmates, meeting them after a long time. It's soothing as the hydrangeas bloom beautifully. I'm going to visit here again. Foreign tourists also enjoyed their time at the festival, saying that it's different from where they come from. I've like really enjoyed the experience. Um, it's my first time being in an area this kind of like surrounded by the hydrangeas. They're a favorite flower of mine, so just being here has been really peaceful. And also the people around have been very like relaxed and nice, and it just has great vibes. <laughs> I mean, in Singapore, we don't usually get a lot of opportunities to see so many pretty flowers like with these colors, and we don't get many parks like this, so I'm not used to this kind of tranquility. As the relaxing hydrangea festivals are held until the end of summer, why not visit Jeju to experience the beautiful vibes of hydrangeas? Park Geun-hye, Arirang News, Jeju.
Good morning, I'm Kim Jeong, and now we turn off to stories from around the world. We begin today in the US, where President Joe Biden on Tuesday local time announced a new policy aimed at protecting hundreds of thousands of undocumented spouses of US citizens from deportation. Under Tuesday's executive order, some 500,000 people will be shielded from deportation, given the right to work in the U.S. and a guided pathway to U.S. citizenship. The program applies to those who have lived in the U.S. for at least 10 years as of June 17th, while some 50,000 children under the age of 21 with the U.S. citizen parent will also be eligible. While Biden's new executive action is widely seen as one of the most significant policies to protect immigrants since Obama's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program enacted 12 years ago, Republican Senator Bill Cassidy said that Biden's got a political problem in that he's going to shut the border down while also reassuring his progressive left. With the support of nearly all of the country's lawmakers, Thailand's Senate on Tuesday passed the final readings of a marriage equality law, leaving only the royal approval before Thailand becomes the first country in Southeast Asia to recognize same-sex couples. The 152-member Thai Senate voted overwhelmingly in favor, with 130 votes for and only four votes against, while 18 senators abstained. The Marriage Equality Act includes amendments to the language in Thailand's civil code, civil and commercial code concerning spouses, by changing men and women and husband and wife to individuals and marriage partners. Lawmakers and activists were seen celebrating inside and outside of the Thai parliament, waving rainbow flags in solidarity with the LGBT community. The bill now awaits the pro forma endorsement by the King of Thailand, which will then be published in the Royal Gazette with the bill's effective date set for within 120 days of publication. Now to Saudi Arabia, where the annual five-day Hajj Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca comes to an end on Wednesday. Pilgrims began performing the farewell tawaf on Tuesday, which includes the circling of the Kaaba in Mecca's Grand Mosque for the final time. According to authorities, more than 1.6 million Muslims from 22 countries traveled to Mecca this year, while around 222,000 Saudi nationals and residents performed Hajj. Scorching heat of up to 51.8 degrees Celsius resulted in a number of casualties this year. The Hajj is one of the five pillars of Islam and is a religious duty that must be undertaken by all able-bodied Muslims at least once in their lifetime. Walter, the future reading oracle orangutan at Dortmund Zoo, has his latest predictions saying that Germany will win against Hungary in its second game of Euro 2024. The 35-year-old Smatran orangutan has predicted World Cup, Euros, as well as European club competition results and made his latest predictions on Tuesday by picking a sack of fresh fruits decorated with the German national football team's scarf first. Walter then went to take the Hungarian scarf as well, which the zoo spokesperson said he interprets it as Hungary scoring an honourable goal at the end. Walter predicted Germany's win against Scotland in the Euro opening match. Good morning. The mercury continues its upward trend across Korea, going 5 to 7 degrees above normal, with heat advisories in place for more parts of Korea. Seoul is forecast to have the season's highest temperatures at 35 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, the monsoon season kicks off on Jeju tonight. By Friday, Jeju could see up to 200 millimeters of heavy monsoon rain, while the rest of the southern regions could see 5 to 20 millimeters of rain until tomorrow. But the rest of the country will be under sunny skies with very high UV rays today. And afternoon highs will be 1 to 5 degrees higher this afternoon, topping out at 35 degrees here in Seoul, Chuncheon, 
Daejeon, Gwangju, and Daegu, Gyeongju at 36 degrees. Now, tomorrow is said to be as hot as today. The monsoon season in central regions usually begins around June 25th, but no exact date has been given by the weather agency. Meanwhile, monsoon showers on Jeju will continue into early next week. With that in mind, let's take a look at the international weather conditions. We thank you for watching New Day at Arirang. We'll be back tomorrow at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time. Thank you.